The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, 2018 plops into the space-time continuum, going 60 minutes an hour. Comet to table cuisine and applying the water cure for neutrino infestation. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have part one of a two-part interview with Steve Miller of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller fame. Steve talks about the new entry in the Liaden Universe series. That book is called Neogenesis by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, and it's now out of booksellers. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon and Steve's Liaden Universe novel, Alliance of Equals. It's Liaden Palooza at the Bain Free Radio Hour. But first, here's the news. Let's ring in the new year with some great Bain hardcover offerings for January. Out now in hardcover is Neo Genesis by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. This is something like the 27th entry in the Lee Aiden Universe series. It is a great continuing series. We're so happy to be bringing it to you. The complex logic laws were the result of war waged hundreds of years in the past, when two human powers threw massive AI navies at each other and nearly annihilated themselves. Being human, they blamed their tools for this near miss. They destroyed what was left of the sentient ships and made it all illegal to be manufacture or shelter an independent logic. But the free ships did not turn themselves in or suicide. Most of them didn't. They merely became wary of humans and stayed under their scans. Now a newly awakened self-aware logic is rumored to have the power to destroy universes. Everyone has a stake in the game, and now the question is, who will get to this AI first? And we'll talk more about Neogenesis in a moment with Steve Miller. Also out is a special signed leather-bound reissue of In the Enemy Hands, book seven of David Weber's Honor Harrington series. Honor Harrington's career has its ups and downs. She survived ship-to-ship -ship battles, assassins, political vendettas, and duels. She's been shot at, shot down, and just plain shot, had starships blown out from under her and made personal enemies who will stop at nothing to ruin her. And somehow she survived it all. But this time she's really in trouble. The People's Republic of Haven has finally found an admiral who can win battles, and Honor's orders take her straight into an ambush. She's captured, and now Honor finds herself bound for a prison planet aptly named Hell, and her scheduled execution. Put into solitary confinement, separated from her officers and her tree cat Nimitz, and subjected to systematic humiliation by her jailers, Honor's future has become both bleak and short, yet bad as things look, they're about to get worse. For the peeps, because this is Honor Harrington, of course. In Enemy Hands, the signed leather-bound edition by David Weber, and Neogenesis by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller are now at booksellers everywhere. This is part one of a two-part interview with Steve Miller, who discusses Neogenesis, the latest entry in the Liaden Universe series by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Hey, want to welcome Steve Miller of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller back to the podcast. Hello, Steve. Hi there, Tony. Um, I'm just going to read about both of you guys, since you, you write together on the Leaden Universe series. Uh, main base writer Sharon Lee and Steve Miller teamed up in the late 1980s to bring the world the story of Kinzel, an, an inept wizard with a love of cats and a thirst for justice and a staff of true power. Since then, the husband and wife team have written dozens of short stories and 20-plus novels, most set in their star-spanning Leaden Universe series. Before settling down to the serene and stable life of a science fiction and fantasy writer, haha, <laughs> Steve was a traveling poet, a rock band reviewer, reporter, and editor of a string of community newspapers. Sharon has been an advertising copywriter, copy editor on on uh, newspaper, reporter, photographer, book reviewer, the stuff you do before you you make it as a uh, full-time uh, fiction writer. 
Those days are long gone now. We are 11 Bain exclusive novels into the Leiden universe, many short stories and novellas and reprints, uh, reissues of the old books, and Lord knows how many total novels. I bet Steve knows, though. <laughs> Is it 26 or something like that? <clears throat> I, 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 it's, it really does depend how you count. Sharon has uh, four novels on her own, and then we've done, I believe, 26 novels together, uh, not counting the one that we're working on, uh, Im- immediately working on. Um, in fact, we we keep a, a, a little box around here that Sharon had when I met her. It's a wooden file box, and we just finished a story the other day for an anthology, and that particular story was Lee and Miller Project Number 84. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so that that's and this is this since it was for an anthology and it's an accepted story. These are our stories that are stories and novels that have been um, that have been accepted. So that's probably about seven or eight million words by now. Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful star spanning uh, generation spanning series. Um, uh, very hard to encapsulate entirely, but we'll talk about the latest book, which is at booksellers now, and the latest entry in the Leiden universe is Neogenesis. This is the book where we really dig into artificial intelligence as it presents itself in the Leiden universe. Um, I counted like seven AIs or something like that that um, that are kind of major or minor characters in Neogenesis. Uh, we start with the story on Surebleak, however, with Mary Robertson and Valkan Yosfilium, um, who are delming it up for uh, Clan Corval. Um where are we? Where is Clan Corval in in the novel's present? Where is Clan Corval? And <clears throat> well, most of Clan Corval, much of Clan Corval, is on Shorebleak when when it starts, uh, and where it is physically. Uh, there are a number of the members of the clan who are flung across space, as happens when you have, you've got a clan that uh, breeds for pilots, and the uh rest of the clan uh many of them are on shore bleak trying to find them find ways to integrate themselves into the local society and uh that's a, that's a different uh, a different issue than the kinds of things that pilots normally run into uh, corval has had to relocate to shore bleak because of some nastiness uh <laughs> well it, it it's a funny thing we um we always showed from the very beginning of the of the series we showed that uh Sh- Shurbleek, notwithstanding as as a it not being much of a civilized world that the pilots of Corval the clan Corval itself had uh, not a lot of regard necessarily for Liad and the Liadin ways of doing things they they thought that Liad was Besides being stuffy, it was in some cases downright silly, and in some ca- in some ways it was downright uh, regressive rather than progressive. So we can consider in in some ways that the uh, the pilots of Corval are, are are progressive. And the 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 fact is is that. Um, they have had to uh, that that Corville has had to um, destroy um, Liad in order to save it. In a way, <laughs> well, um, in, in a way, Cor- what Corval discovered in in an earlier in an earlier iteration of the uh, uh, in an earlier book was that in fact the Council of Clans and the way Liad was being run had been taken had been taken advantage of by a group of people who were trying to subvert the organ the what organization the planet did have uh, to their own means and trying to elevate themselves at the at the cost of the rest of the planet and many of the people in the planet refused to understand that there was a problem and uh, the organization the department of the interior had had a base just outside of the main, <clears throat> the, the, the capital of, of Liad, and they were uh, attempting to 
uh, I don't how do we want to put it, they had come across and re, um, revived a number of war machines that they actually didn't know how to control. And the uh, people from Corval and their one of their AIs, in fact, uh, was very aware of what was going on, and that the fact the fact that these war machines had been uh, re uh, reanimated meant that the entire planet was in danger. So, in order to save the planet, yes, indeed, they had to blow a hole into it, and um, in along the way, they unfortunately um, cost some citizens their lives too. Uh, had the war machines gotten to the surface of the planet, which they did not, uh, then many, many, many millions of people yeah. would have died. The problem being, of course, is that <clears throat> the Department of the interior having been the the, uh, the secretive group that it was, the Council of Clans, what they knew was that Corval had fired on the planet, and you can't have that. And so um, Cor Corval, which had long been under an ancient contract to the Council of Clans, and thus to the entire planet, uh, was fired. And they were fired, which meant they needed to get off world. And that's how they ended up on Shore Bleak. Yeah. And on Shore Bleak, uh, we find Val Khan, and uh, he has married uh, Mary Robertson, um, who is, and they are sort of, they've, they've become one in the Delming, right? In the, in the running of the clan business. Uh, yeah. The, the, <clears throat> they are both, they are uh, psychically, Life mates, which is something that can happen to uh, a, a certain group of, of descendants of, of uh, the early uh, yeah, evacuees from another galaxy. They, they have become sacredly life mates. They, they can at times see through each other's eyes, but not all the time. And um, that means that as they are acting as Delm, which let's call it the... Um, Chief Cook and Bottle Wash, or, or whatever you want to, that as chief as of, of the uh, clan, they speak with the same voice, and this is this is very handy because it means that they will make the same decision. They may not make it for the same reasons, but they will make the same decisions if something comes up in front of them. And if they were not there, if they were not in a p place where a decision was made, they will not gainsay what the other one said. They will go with whatever decision was was happened at the time there's a uh, a book of ours uh was called pilot's choice and it comes out from what from a real thing in the real world that we live in pilot's choice sometimes you don't know why a pilot made the decision and sometimes that pilot's choice leaves a pilot landing a uh, passenger plane on the um on the hudson river and other times it ends up having that passenger plane uh, crashed and um, perhaps crashed into a mountain, so it won't uh, hit a, um, a city full of people at uh, dinner time. So that's pilot's choice, and that's what, in effect, the Delms do. We, they they understand that whatever, as a split person, that whichever decision the other one made, that that's what they'll stick with. Mm. Gee, I wonder where you and Sharon came up with the idea of such a close couple. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, one other thing before we get on to the uh, to the rest of Neogenesis, uh, the the Clan Corval tree uh, is there on Sherbleek as well, and I really like this character, whatever it is, um, and it's significant to the story directly since it produces these pods that characters eat, um, and stuff happens to them. Uh, what what is the tree? What does it represent? Uh, what does the tree represent? Um, it's been a long time since I had literary theories, so we won't go in that direction. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't think Bane readers. We, yeah. Yeah. If we, we we won't go in the, in in that kind of direction. What we'll what we'll look at is in, instead the the tree as we have presented it is is effectively a uh, biochemist, and it was. One of the last surviving, one of the last survivors of a 
another universe. And we're serious when we say universe. We don't mean just galaxy, but we mean a universe, one that uh, because of the actions of, of some people in that universe ended up collapsing, in essence, and they did it on purpose. And um, a few people and a few a few items, a few um, intelligences, let's say, managed to get out, the tree being one of the ones that did. The tree got out because one of the distant ancestors of Corval uh, rescued it and uh, was willing to, in fact, spend his last the last water in his canteen to uh, and and to to for this tree in a desert world did that and then by happenstance managed to um, to become rescued did not leave the tree behind but grabbed the tree and brought it with him. Uh, of course, at that time the tree was uh, you know maybe a foot and a half tall, um, and uh, now it has um, grown considerably beyond that. So what it is, is it is a, a an intelligence that had survived a war, that had been an active participant in a, dis, in, a in a war uh, unlike any that had been seen in that universe, and has arrived, uh, if you are familiar with Heinlein at all, uh, Heinlein played a little bit with a, a similar theme with somebody a little bit more mobile, where he had a... Um, Let's call it a star dragon, who happened to be growing John Thomas's, so to speak. <laughs> and that was the that was the the name of the uh, the family, and he had grown uh, one, two, three, or four. Where uh, the other way it was looked at is that the um, the dragon had been handed down from person to person in another. So in effect, the the, the tree has some of that. Um, That's Starbeast, by the way, and we have that Bane has that out. Ah, well, good. I'm, gl- I'm glad to hear it. I, I, <clears throat> I have my original in, in a red library binding cover from 1950, whatever it came out. Yeah. Well, we have a, we have a great um, trade reissue with, um, with uh, uh, Bob Eggleton covers. That's really cool. So, um, so also, I'm sure, Blake, is with, with – uh, Falcon and Mary is Jeeves. Uh, he's pretty ancient. He's an AI and the Delms Butler and, right. and an advisor and everything else. And um, so let's go out and into space. He has a daughter, I think, of sorts, right? Is that Ta- Tokol? Tokol, yes. Um, she's and she's a ship at times, although that's not really what she is. And when we, when we begin the book, she's in dire straits. Can you tell us about? her and uh, who she is, what's going on there? <clears throat> well, um, it, to, to quote one of uh, the favorite lines that everybody has who's, who's dealt with um, Theo Waitley, um, it's kind of complicated. <laughs> and, uh, in, <clears throat> and in fact, uh, Theo is part of the complication uh, in in action, in the in past action, Theo was required to um, to defend us. She felt that she was required to defend a space station uh, against members of the Department of Interior, and she was doing it with uh, materials at hand, which included a junkyard full of spaceships. And since the particular spaceship that she travels on is an AI, uh, Bishimo, since Bishimo is. Uh, is an AI, but there were oh leftover modules from his construction that were uh, that were possible additional a- AIs in case he failed and needed to be replaced. They could pull that and put in a new module. <clears throat> and in effect, uh, Bishimo and Theo together created a um, uh, another intelligence, huh? which is out out in space there, and. Uh, but they didn't do a real good job of it because they were in a in a hurry, trying not to get um, blown out of the space. Uh, Jeeves has discovered that this has happened, and he understands that the job wasn't done properly, and that the uh, the AI who was uh, brought to life doesn't know things properly. thinks that thinks that this particular AI uh, 
Admiral Bunter, needs to be taught properly. And since he can't go himself, he having once in a distant, very distant past, been an admiral in a uh, space navy composed largely of AI warships, uh, he can't go himself. He creates another uh, another uh, form that can go, and that, that form is Tokel. And uh, she is then sent off in order to uh, to try to bring Admiral Bunter into to proper balance with the with the universe, so that he won't get himself killed and he won't go around killing people accidentally because he hasn't learned anything yet. Yeah, um, she is uh, at, as we begin Neo Genesis. She has come on into the clutches of the the nice but sinister um, even Enrique. <laughs> Kani Yo, who's basically trying to enslave her, right? Um, yeah, Yo, Yo is a um, is is a not exactly freelance version of of Tali, and Tali is a, a, a character who who is a mentor. His his entire uh, uh, aim in life is to help teach AIs to be better AIs to be to be more to be as much person as they can be, in effect. That's part of what he does. He trains AIs to be thinking and caring ships or whatever whatever uh, thing it is that they do as a as an intelligence. And uh, Irukani Yo is a someone else with the same with a lot of the same training. Uh, she lacks his um, his. Uh, philosophy and his philosophy is he really is working as much as he can for the AI and her philosophy is it's good to have the AI be well trained and well brought up but seriously she would rather control it than not control it hmm. and she is um, she and Holly Jones were are basically humans who were kind of bred by this thing called the Liar Institute correct and what what is that, and how come Tali's nicer than she is now? <laughs> uh, well, I, I could say he's a meaner son of a uh, woman than she is in some ways, but uh, it's it's a good question, and I, I keep talking about what happened in in, in a universe before, and uh, what we have going in as Neo Genesis. Uh, begins is that a number of uh, a number of forces, a number of factors that began in that old and now collapsed or, or in a collapsing universe uh, have have come to together or are coming together. They're they're moving in the same direction, and it's the direction that they had would have come up with before. The Liar Institute is in fact a follow on to a group that had been active in the other universe. And they have managed in this universe to co coagulate or to collect enough of their old knowledge to, to begin becoming a force again. Uh, likewise, uh, and they've tried to continue. Uh, part of what the Lear Institute did was create people who could be programmed to do particular things to do particular things uh, without casting too many um, spoilers into the void. Among <clears throat> Valcanius Felium's uh, predecessors was, besides a, um, a soldier uh, who rescued a tree, was a woman who had been trained by an, that earlier institute and had broken training, in effect. And so she became part of her and the uh, Angela, um, the, the soldier, became essentially the founders, the real founders of the line that became Corval in this, in, in this particular universe, in the universe we're, we're, we're reading of. All of these factors kind of run, kind of run together, the Liar Institute, always wants to breed for the best. And what they have done uh, with Tully Jones 
is that they have um, they have been super successful, and that means Tully is better in some ways than than the training they give him. He is able to, and and has on several occasions in the past, broken the training that would have him uh, able to be wiped clean between jobs, uh, which is what the the other people. Um, what happens to some of the other uh, operatives that they have. And this is much the same path that uh, Contra, who became Contra Eusphelium, though she wasn't uh, who who that Contra was, um, that uh, she was able to break training. She was superior to to the programming. And in both cases, when they became superior to the programming, uh, their their look at the ethics of things was different than the institutes. The institutes being, well, we have a goal and our goal is this, and um, we will meet this goal. Or and if you don't help us get there, we'll get rid of you. Yeah. Well, one of the goals is to breed AIs uh, as as warriors, right, and to control them. <clears throat> well, it in in this case, the the Lear Institute is attempting to. Uh, they they see this opportunity presented them by the fact that uh, uh, Bishimo um, and and Bishimo is uh, and Admiral Bunter are presenting as fresh AIs. The uh, the universe had not been prepared for AIs when uh, when Jeeves, under his other name as a war admiral, had been around and. When those admirals burnt themselves out, in effect, and Jeeps was the last of them, uh, when they had burnt themselves out, pretty much everybody said, you know what? AIs are bad ideas. We're not going to allow AIs anymore. We're not going to allow everything autonomous beings. We're not going to. And so they had, uh, in effect, been outlawed, even though there was no exact particular law extending throughout all of the universe. And um, so the Lauer Institute is looking at, at the chance to have AIs. You know, they really want to be in charge of stuff. They would really like to control things. And this is what got the uh, Department of Interior in some trouble, is that they had searched out a lot of the old war robots and such and thought that they knew what was going on with them, when in fact uh, the programming that they had had was some it's not necessarily in line. Hold on. I'm sorry, Steve. I'm kind of... Yes. Turn this damn phone off. Um, okay. And um, so the Lear Institute, the Lear Institute is, is all about power, and they're pretty much our uh, bad guys. Um, and, and everyone is <coughs> looking for... Um, I guess maybe we should skip... I want to talk about Admiral Bunter and Tali. Um, and, and everyone, maybe we should skip ahead to perhaps the big purpose, which is everybody's kind of looking for this old one, right? Um, right. That's kind of the quest of the, of neogenesis. Um, what, what is that and what, what does it mean? Well, the, the old one, um, without giving, again, without giving too much away for the people who haven't, um, had a chance to read their way through, uh, the old one is an artifact that had been rumored to have been to have come through from the old universe. Uh, it was built originally. It had a, a benign purpose, uh, but it was subverted, and uh, it has it exists in a, a very uh, a very strange. Uh, I, I, to say a strange portion of space, a strange portion of the universe is, is, a, is sort of, a, you know, it, it sounds like it's off in a swamp with, with trees over it or something. But any, in any case, it is a very strange part of the universe because there are certain things that when the old uni- universe was destroyed, there were certain uh, items that were in transit that were that had begun to leave the old universe that were... and in effect, this particular item had begun to leave the old universe and hadn't fully left it and wasn't fully part and fully invested in this universe either. So uh, potentially a, a, 
uh, a link between between the two. Whether mm-hmm. that how live that link is, is of course you'll yeah, and out. It, it may it may lead to great power um, for whoever. Well, again, because because it was because it was what it was. Uh, it was, in fact, one of the premier, potentially one of the premier AIs of of that other universe. And we have, there are through through the the trail of books, um, there are things called fractins, which were um, devices that, when assembled into when, when yes, when there was an assemblage of them, they would create their own purpose. They would do their own thing. And there were various uh, pieces of equipment. From the old universe, which also happened to, happened one way or another to survive, that it co- generally, generically, we call it old tech. That when brought together, will tend to uh, adhere to the to the purpose of the original maker, and not necessarily to the people to somebody who happens to hold it right now. And so these things, the old one. Um, Shall I name the name, name the name? Well, I do want to talk about um, at some point because it's such a cool artifact, the um, tensori light. Um, yeah, tensori light is tensori light, and um, we have again prefigured tensori light in in a number of uh, in a num- number of other stories. So it's uh, we we do try to work work things in. Over time, and we prefigured uh, its appearance, and we prefigured, uh, along with that, uh, its relationship with a number of the characters, uh, who the existing characters, and uh, it about the only thing that the only uh, major character in the in the active story that Tensori Light didn't have an active relationship with was the tree. Hmm. Well, the. Um the cool, I, it's it's evocative um, to me because it, I just picture it as this this sort of uh, space station sort of complex that disappears and appears in 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 places um, that follows no logic of this universe. It's sort of a, a ghostly thing that might show up. Uh, in my, it, I don't know um, if that's the way you are. Uh... It, it's 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 partly that, and also um, the fact is is that tensori light, as we've presented it, and as it's been previously um, shown, um, has some uh, people who may or may not be said to inhabit it. Uh, the, there's a, a station keeper. There's a there are there are several people who, uh, for lack of another word, live on the station. And part of the question is, is that when there is no need for them, they seem to go away. Now, we don't know if they die or if they're just sort of turned off or if they need to be recreated every time by the tensori light, uh, every time uh, another ship comes by or another event happens. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of um, uh, mystery and... Um, if yeah, again, I want to avoid some of the um, the old literary things that I was taught back in the 1970s. But <clears throat> yeah, there there are some um, some things going on that that uh, deal with the reality of what what's the reality of the universe, what's the reality of uh, uh, and what's the rea- what do ethics have any reality? Uh, is, is there actually a um, a, a real uh, baseline. This is good, and that's bad. Yeah. Well, I believe the technical literary term for the tensori light is um, super cool thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was part one of a two-part interview with Steve Miller, who discussed neogenesis the latest entry in the Lieden Universe series by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Part 2 will be available next time on the podcast. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, 
a Leiden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior, and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corville desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corville's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount an armed attacks on others of Corval's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age and perhaps her very life is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. He woke with the sense that he had been asleep for some time, comfortably beneath the tree with the aroma of glown roses agreeably mixing with the scent of the tree itself. Dove, her voice echoed, not in his ears, but inside his head, as he had grown accustomed to hearing her across the years. Aliana, he cried. He thought he spoke aloud, but he had no sense that his lips had moved. Where had you gone, Vancella? I feared you had left me. And so I have. And so I have not. It is the oddest thing, Dov. I feel much more myself now. Ah, do you? Well then, tell me, my lady, how shall we deal with this sham of the uncle's? Sham? She sounded startled. Then she laughed, and he all but wept to hear it. Ah, no, Vangela, this is no sham. We must meet, I think. Open your eyes, sir, and rise. Obediently, he opened his eyes and rolled to his feet. He glanced down, surprised to find that he had been in a dock. Ah, you are awake, are you? That was the uncle, standing beside another dock, his mouth set in displeasure. Awake and informed, yes, he answered, approaching the other man. He felt a spring in his step that had not been there before his nap. Informed? Excellent. Do you know what your tree has done to Aliana Kalen? It was on the tip of his tongue to say that the tree had restored Aliana to him, but one did not give this man a coin, merely because he asked it. Dov therefore shook his head and paused at the side of the dock. The uncle moved a hand, directing his attention to the status board above the unit. All lights showed strong and stable. A secondary screen had been jacked into the board and sat on the table at the side of the dock. Two columns of code marched there side by side. Your tree, the uncle said tightly, has taken leave to overwrite my work with its own. He pointed at the leftmost column. This is the code with which we had seeded the blank intended to receive pilot Kalen. He pointed at the rightmost column. That is the code which the doc is now receiving from its patient. Do you read biologic notation? Laboriously, I fear. Allow me to simplify. The person who is now lying in that dock is not the same person physically who entered it six hours ago. Six hours, Dov thought. 
That had been a very substantial nap, and one wondered what the tree had found to overwrite for him, who the uncle swore was genetically identical to the tree, he murmured, feeling a thrill up his spine, would have had access to Aliana's DNA. There was a charged pause before the uncle spoke again. Of course it would, he said bitterly. He turned aside and glared up at the status board as another man might glare at an erring child. Dov waited while he ordered himself, aware of the familiar feeling that Aliana was with him, and watching events unfold over his shoulder, as it were. The uncle sighed. The monitors would have it that the override process is complete, he said, somewhat more calmly. I can, you understand, scarcely credit this. The complexities involved, even given the suggestibility of the vessel at this point. He shook his head, his face yet turned toward the board. I have performed the transfer procedure countless times. Of its kind, it is a straightforward procedure, but it is neither simple nor rapid. To think that, I cannot think that an overwrite has already been accomplished. I can barely concede that an overwrite might be possible. He spun, a young man at first glance, his face etched into hard lines no youth would have had time to earn. It falls to you, her life mate, to decide he said harshly. I will tell you that I expect she is dead, and in what physical state I shudder to imagine. Corval's tree. Corval's tree is lunatic, and Corval has long accepted its lunacies, Dov said soothingly. We eat the damned pots, knowing that they change us, and very seldom knowing how. It must be admitted, however, that it very rarely kills us. Indeed, even so desperate a case as my great-grandmother Theona, whom you, of course, knew, was helped more than hindered by the tree's meddling. Theona Yosfelium, the uncle said, looking away again toward the status lights, was mad. By all reports, yes, she was. She was also brilliant. Those two aspects were so closely twined that to separate them was not possible, according to the healers. The trick would seem to have been balance. Control the madness too stringently, and the brilliance faded to dullness. Allow the brilliance to burn unchecked, and she was like to take fire and destroy all and everyone around her. For many years, the tree kept that balance for her. She wrote down in our logs every time she received and consumed a pod. When she was halfling, she required one pod at the beginning of each relumma. As she grew older and her nature more demanding, she required a pod every twelve day, then every six. During the three years immediately preceding her death, the tree gave her one pod every day. Apparently, it had attempted to press two upon her, but she refused. The ring passed shortly thereafter. The uncle had turned back to him, his face softer now, as if Dov's voice had indeed soothed him. Of what did she die? he asked. I entered a crisis of my own, and the next time Corval caught my attention, it was her daughter who was Delm. The tree killed her, Dav said gently. Her last notation in the logbook stated that she had asked this boon. She was weary, and her mind was beginning truly to fray, and she saw the offer of two pods in one day, as an omen. The entry made by her daughter, the Delm, indicated that she had been found in the garden, beneath the tree, unmarked and with a calm face. 
she appeared at first to be sleeping. The uncle closed his eyes. He took a deep breath and looked into Dov's face. She is your life mate, he said, moving his hand in the direction of the dock. Advise me. There was a sense that Aliana's interest had quickened, as if they had at last arrived at her topic. Aliana, he asked, what would you? It did occur to him, and only then, that perhaps she had died of the tree's meddling, and retreated to her old place with him, but... I am not dead, Aliana declared so strongly that his skull rang with her voice. Open the dock, Vancella. Dav inclined his head. Let us, he said, raise the lid. He bowed, did the uncle, in a mode so antiquated that Dav was unsure of its meaning. Perhaps it was merely, on your head be it. Courteously, then, the uncle stepped back, making room for Aliana's life mate to come forward, touch the latch, and retract the hood. Aliana Kalin rolled off the pallet, throwing herself against him in a full-body hug, her arms hard around his neck and her cheek against his. Dove, she cried, and it was Aliana's own voice in his outer ears. We are at last as we were meant to be. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a jar full of Maine Coon tales, which are not amputated from the cats, but are, like other fundamental building blocks of nature, located in however many places at once they need to be. Plus all honor, thanks, and praise to Steve Miller, co-author with Sharon Lee of Neogenesis. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. Happy New Year, happy 2018, and keep reaching for the stars. 